great name of Jesus, high and lifted up. Do you believe that this morning? I was looking at the cross when we were singing that, and I was thinking about the, the paradox of him being lifted up on that cross and how that led to him being lifted up in heaven. It's just an amazing thought. We've been studying the book of Romans lately. If it's your first time with us this morning, you're you're here on a good week, because this morning I'm going to do a lot of review, okay? Glenn Knight is going to be with us next week. So uh, Glenn Knight is a missionary over in the Philippines, so he'll he'll be up here next week preaching God's Word. In the month of June, we're going to take a little break from Romans, and we're going, to do, we're going to do something called All In, where we're going to talk about the body and serving as a body together. In July, we're going to come back to Romans, and we're going to hit Romans 7 in July, okay? Romans 7 is a tough chapter, so rearrange your vacation. Make sure you're here in July <laughs> for Romans 7. Today, we're going to do a little bit of review, but at the same time, maybe introduce a new thought or new concept to us. Uh, I've entitled this sermon, More of Him, More of Me, Grace-Driven Sanctification. A little play on the thought, you know, you know more of, often we say more of, <clears throat> more of Jesus, less of me, but I want to challenge us this morning that if we believe that the old us is dead and there's a new us that is connected to Christ, then maybe what we should be saying is more of him and more of me, the new me. Let the new me out. And so grace-driven sanctification. Sanctification's a big word. It simply means that we are set apart. At its root, that's what sanctification means. If you are sanctified, you are set apart set apart to be transformed into the image of Christ for God's glory and our joy. That's the the Pastor Brady definition of sanctification. There's a thousand definitions of sanctification out there in in a thousand different books, but this is sort of uh, my working definition. We are set apart to be transformed into the image of Christ For God's glory, that's the ultimate end, for God's glory and for our joy. And we steal some of those thoughts from John chapter 15, and we'll see that a little bit later in the the sermon. So sometimes we attack life this way by saying, uh, 100% me. So this is the mindset of, I'm going to try harder, I'm going to do more, I'm going to get closer, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to overcome this sin, um, behavior modification, the, the 100% me mentality, and I think most of us would agree that's wrong. Sometimes we have the 100% God mentality, the let go and let God, Jesus take the wheel kind of thing, right? Well, God's going to do what God's going to do, right? I can't do anything. I'm just going to step back and let God handle it, and that's wrong because then we end up doing nothing, We're not called to do nothing. We're called to do something. So 100% God and 100% me might be a better place to land. This is, I live as Christ lives through me, living by faith in God's grace. Now, when I say, or Pastor Mark in the future, if we say 100% God, 100% me, please understand that we're not saying that you and God are equal. What we're saying is that God is doing the work, but he's doing it through you. And you submit to that work. We saw this in Romans 6, and that's kind of why we're doing this this morning, is we're taking the thoughts that Paul introduced to us in Romans 6, these thoughts of presenting ourselves, and we're going to try to expand on those a little bit this morning after we do a little bit of review. Grace-driven sanctification requires grace-driven effort. Grace-driven sanctification. And here's what I'm saying. 
if you are going to be transformed into the image of Christ for God's glory and your joy, if you are going to be transformed into the image of Christ, you have to pursue that. You don't stumble into that, Christian. It doesn't magically happen while you sleep. Right? Otherwise, the minute you got saved, you would have been super Christian, if you will. You would have been doing everything right. And none of us in this room have that testimony, do we? I got saved, and as soon as I got saved, I never worried again. I never hated anyone ever again. I never had an argument, never had a dirty thought, never, had, it all went away. That didn't happen, did it? But you have to rely on the grace of God for it to happen. So it's grace driven, grace driven. Mark and I were talking about this, and um, I was kind of reluctant to talk about this this morning because I feel like as soon as we throw out the word effort, there's a danger there. And I, and I said to him, before I, before I go into effort, I want to make sure that this church is so soaked and saturated in grace that we understand that our effort only happens by grace. And, he, and Mark said, I, I think we're there. And I doubted a little bit, so you guys, we'll, we'll see how we do it at the end of this. <laughs> the emails and everything will, will tell us, I guess, <laughs> where we are. So here's our quick outline, God's role in sanctification, then my role, and then we'll look at some examples if we have time. Uh, God's role can be summed up in one word, it's grace. My role or your role in sanctification can be summed up in one word, faith. Okay? So God's role is grace, we need grace. Here's where it gets into being a review. In Romans 1, we saw that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. We need grace because of the wrath of God. God's wrath is being revealed. We learned that this was months ago now. I don't even know how many months ago we did Romans chapter 1. The wrath of God is being revealed against all ungodliness. Chapter 1, verse 23 said that they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, animals, creeping things. We need grace because without it, we look for glory in all the wrong places. You and I were created for glory. I hope you understand that, that the reason you exist is to experience and reflect the glory of God. We call that imaging. We image God, right? Man is made in the image of God. And man has inside of him a, a hole, a glory hole, sometimes I call it, a glory hole that he is constantly trying to fill. And without Christ, you're going to fill it with all kinds of things, right? This is what Paul taught us in Romans chapter 1, that we go around filling that hole with images, and then later on, he'll talk about all different kinds of sins that we fill it with. Everything from homosexuality to gossip are all attempts to fill that hole. So we need grace. Verse 12, two, chapter 2, verse 12. All who sin under the law will be judged by the law. We need grace because religion can't save us. Do you remember in Romans 1, Paul talked to basically like the 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 heathen Gentiles, the Gentiles who they don't have the law, they don't have the Bible, if you will. And he, he talked to them and he said, you're condemned, you're condemned. But then in chapter two, Paul starts talking to the religious types, right? And guess what he tells them? You're condemned. Same thing. If you live under the law, you're going to be judged by the law. And if you're judged by the law, you're in trouble. And we made a big point of saying that the law is the basis of our acceptance before God. That has not changed. God has not set aside the law as his standard. Every single one of us is judged by the law. If you want to say the Ten Commandments, we are judged by that. If you want to narrow it down to love God, love others, we're judged by that. 
And so that, of course, is a terrifying thought. Right? Because you don't do it. And neither do I. I break all ten. I, I don't love God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. I don't love my neighbor as myself. And so, therefore, I'm in trouble. And so we look like this. We introduced these drawings a couple weeks ago. God's yellow, you're red. Before you get saved, right? Our spirit is full of sin, our soul, and our body. Paul goes on to say in chapter 3, in, in case you're not following him, he makes it real, real clear, no one's righteous, all have sinned. We need grace because every single one of us has sinned. And thank God that the book doesn't end at chapter 3, verse 20, right? There's some good news. There's bad news. Bad news is, if you got the Bible, if you've grown up with the Bible and religion, you're condemned. If you've grown up without the Bible and religion, you're still condemned, both condemned. But there's good news. God's role also includes Christ dying for us. Chapter 3, 24 through 26, we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a what? Let's all say it. As a what? Propitiation. propitiation. Everybody say propitiation. propitiation. Big word. It means that God's wrath is satisfied by his blood to be received by faith. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So Christ died for us to satisfy God's wrath. God is both just and justifier. He's just in that he punishes sin. He is justifier in that he forgives sin. But that's what makes the cross so amazing is that it accomplishes both at the same exact time. God's holiness and his love both satisfied at the same event, the death of Jesus Christ. Every sin punished, every sin forgiven simultaneously. Four, verse five, and to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Christ died for us so that if we trust in him, his righteousness is imputed to our account. So we've held up our journal, our ledger, a few times in here. And we've said, look, before you get saved, you've got all kinds of sins on your record. You have all kinds of bills for sins. Oh, no, I forgot that sin. Oh, my goodness, I cheated in the eighth grade. Oh, my goodness, I had a lustful thought. Oh, wow, I stole a pack of gum. Oh, wow, I had a, an angry thought. And there's millions of these sins, aren't there? on your record. But through Christ, we have his righteousness added to our account. And not only that, every sin is erased from our account. 4 verse 8, blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. Have you ever let that sink in? That your sin will never count against you. And that's all summed up in the big word, justification, right? And you were justified at the moment you got saved, whenever that was. Maybe you were a, a small child, or maybe it was last week, or, or whatever. You got, when you got justified, Christ's righteousness came into your account, and all of your debt, sin debt, was taken away. That's what, that's what the choir just sang beautifully, didn't they? His blood paid my ransom. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus. We also rejoice, this is chapter 5, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Christ's death for us, 
reconciles us to God. We were enemies of God, now we are friends of God. We were against God, now we're for God. We were far from God, now we're near to God. Amen? This is what Paul has been teaching us. Christ died for us. Then in Romans 6, Paul shifts, and he adds this amazing truth to it, that Christ didn't just die for us, Christ died with us. In other words, you died. I died with Christ to sin. A lot of us as Christians, we, we're parked on Christ died for us. And that's great. I hope we all understand that, that Christ died for us. But we need to graduate to, I also died that day. And we're not graduating past the gospel. This is all the gospel, isn't it? We haven't left the, universi the gospel university yet, have we? Okay, so gospel 101, Jesus died for us. Gospel 201 or 301, whatever, I died with Jesus. Okay, 6 verse 3, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We know, verse 6, that our old self was crucified with him. I was baptized into Christ's death, crucified with him. I am no longer under sin's control. In other words, I don't have to sin. When the, when the Bible says that sin doesn't have power over us, please understand this. Does sin still have influence over you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Christian, can you testify that you are still tempted? Anybody, anybody testify to that? Amen. Amen. Can we testify that we fail in that temptation often? But listen, it doesn't have a power over you. You don't have to sin. It no longer condemns you. On top of that, you now have the power to not sin. And we said this a couple weeks ago. When you get saved for the first time, you, you have a choice. Remember the picture? God's yellow and you're totally red. Before you were saved, you had to sin. And I know this is hard to hear, but the Bible even says that the good things you did were actually not good. Isaiah said, all my good deeds are, are filthy rags. Paul said, all my good deeds were garbage. But now that we're saved, we actually have the power to do righteousness. Why? Because I am alive. I didn't stay dead. Jesus didn't stay dead, did he? We got the cross hanging up here, and we got the baptismal pool underneath. The cross represents Jesus' death. The pool represents Jesus' life, right? Don't ever forget that. Did Jesus stay dead? No. Jesus didn't stay dead. He is alive to God. You didn't stay dead. You died that day 2,000 years ago. You died that day. But did you stay dead? No. You're alive to God. You have been raised to new life. Romans 6, 4. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. 6.11, so also, you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God. I was raised to new life. I have purpose and power and peace. Paul says that we are united with Christ in verse 6, verse 5. We have been united with him, grafted into him, into his death, into his resurrection. Jesus' experience becomes your experience. Everything that happened to Jesus happens to you. Jesus died, you died. Jesus buried, you buried. Jesus raised, you raised. Jesus ascends, you ascend. Jesus seated, you seated. Right? Jesus glorified, you glorified. Here's the, and we love all that. All of that's great. Here's the hard one. Jesus suffered, you suffer. That's Romans 8. It's coming. 
I'm not sure when, but Romans 8 is coming. I know when Romans 7 is coming. That's July, right? So, our spirit is now righteous. Sorry, it looks like my, my letter got off a little bit there. You get the idea. At the spirit level, I am righteous. Through justification, I am now right with God. At the spirit level, I am perfect. But it's the soul and the body that still have some problems, right? And so my role, faith. In other words, I have to believe what happened to me at the spirit level. I have to believe that and count on it and trust in it. Every minute of every day, I have to believe that that actually happened. And Paul calls that knowing, reckoning, and presenting ourselves. So we'll go through these quick because this was just a couple weeks ago that we did this. Verse 6, he tells us to know, know this, that your old man was crucified. My growing proceeds from my knowing. That's crucial. You cannot grow in Christ. You are not going to be transformed into the image of Christ without knowing what happened to you at justification. If you don't know that, this is, our faith is all about knowledge. It's all throughout Scripture. Paul constantly is praying, I pray that you will know. I pray that you will know Ephesians 1. I pray that you will know Ephesians 3. I pray that you will know Colossians 1. I pray that you will know Philippians 1. I pray that your love will increase in all knowledge. Knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. It's all over the New Testament. We have to know what happened. My sanctification proceeds from faith in, my, in God's justification work. That's why we don't graduate past the gospel. We have to keep talking about the gospel constantly. So, I know it's hard to see, but now my soul and my body are orange. They're supposed to be orange, showing that there's a battle. Sin is attacking from the outside, and there's a battle happening in my soul. This is a battle between the flesh and the spirit. Romans chapter 8, Galatians chapter 5. Next, Paul tells us to reckon. Reckon yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God. This is faith. I believe that what happened to Jesus happened to me. God didn't remove sin. He removed the sinner. See? God doesn't remove sin. Sin still attacks you. But God removed the sinner, because at your core, you're yellow. You with me? He burned down the sin factory in your life. Okay, Brady, if I'm so yellow, if I'm so perfect at the core, if the, if the Holy Spirit is attached to my spirit, why on earth do I keep sinning all the time? No faith. Romans 14, 23. Anything not of faith is sin. Hebrews eleven six. 6. Without faith, you cannot please God. You sin because you fail to believe in what happened to you that day. You don't really believe that your ledger is blank, your sin ledger is blank, and that your, your, um, your credits is full of Christ's righteousness. You don't believe that. You don't really, in other words, in a nutshell, you don't believe that Jesus is enough. You need more. I have to... I, I have to, so you go, you go one of two ways. You go younger brother, prodigal son story. You go younger brother and say, eh, Jesus is boring. Jesus is, Jesus is lame. Jesus doesn't satisfy. So I'm going to try all these other things to get excitement. Or you go older brother where you say, yeah, I know Jesus did it, but I think I got to work harder. I got to do more. I got to, I got to impress dad, right? Because I guess Jesus didn't impress the father enough. So now you have to impress him. Two, right? And so probably most of us in this room 
are probably, a lot of us in this room, I don't know about most, but a lot of us in this room, we're in the older brother category where because we lack faith, we don't really believe that Jesus' death was enough. So now I'm going to, I'm going to build on top of what Jesus did. I'm going to add to what Jesus did. Because I, I don't think God's happy with me right now because I didn't read my Bible enough last week. I didn't go to church enough. I didn't help enough people. Uh, I got angry. I don't love enough. I don't do all these things. So I'm going to have to do all these things to build onto what Jesus did. That's, that's simply a lack of faith. Do you see that? You don't have faith in what Jesus did. You don't believe that it was enough. You don't believe that it's finished. So as I have faith, my mind begins to reflect my spirit. My soul begins to reflect my spirit because I'm counting myself dead to sin and alive to God. I'm contemplating the glory of Jesus, as 2 Corinthians says. And I'm beginning to be sanctified. I'm beginning to grow. I'm beginning to change. I'm being transformed. My reactions to my, to my husband or wife or my kids or roommate or boss or friends begin to actually reflect that I believe that I am the child of God and that I am completely forgiven rather than reflecting desperation and fear. And then all my relationships turn into manipulations and controlling and all of that, right? Then Paul says, present your body. Present yourselves to God as alive from the dead. I present myself, that proves what I believe. James puts it this way, faith without works is dead. If you believe it, you got to do something, right? Right? I've been set apart spiritually. Now I present my soul and body as set apart. Okay? So my spirit is set apart. Now I present my mind. I present my body as set apart. So it looks like this. Totally yellow. Brady, are you saying we can be perfect? No. But I am saying you can grow. This side of heaven, you'll never be perfect because that sin is bombarding you, isn't it? And here's the kicker, guys. The more you grow, the more you're aware of all those sins that are attacking you. The Christian who says, I'm not struggling with sin, isn't growing. The Christian that's growing is becoming more and more aware of every nook and cranny of his soul. And he's becoming more and more aware of where sin and idolatry and pride have grabbed hold of things. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. That means you got to start growing. My role, faith. I crucify the flesh. This is all going to be in Romans chapter 8. My role by faith is I crucify the flesh. This is what he means to present ourselves. So throughout Scripture, Paul's going to say, we put to death the deeds of the body. Romans 8, we put to death the deeds of the body. Galatians 5, those who have crucified the flesh have put to death the deeds of the flesh. I am dead. The old me is dead. That's a fact, and I need to know it. But listen, the flesh hangs on, and every day I need to put to death, I need to crucify, slowly murder the deeds of the flesh in my heart, in my soul. And I do that how? Through faith. I'll hold that thought. <laughs> then Paul's going to say we walk in the Spirit. And walking in the Spirit means having the mind of the Spirit and keeping in step with the Spirit. And like I said, all that's going to be in Romans chapter 8. We're going to get to that, I promise. And we're going to break that down. But basically, here in a nutshell, walking with the Spirit 
Having the mind of the Spirit, keeping in step with the Spirit, is simply faith. The Spirit is constantly testifying to my spirit what Christ has done for me. And so I'm remembering that. I'm knowing it. I'm reckoning it or counting it as true. And then I present myself. Mind of the Spirit is the idea of knowing it. Step with the Spirit is the idea of action, doing, presenting myself. Okay, now let's look at some other scriptures, and we're going to see how some of these other scriptures show this. In John 15, John says, Jesus says, rather, abide in me. Do you remember this? Where Jesus sees, I am the vine, you are the branches, right? Abide in me. Here's God's part. Apart from me, you can do nothing, Jesus says. But look, here's your part. Faith, abide in me. He goes on to say in verse 9, As the Father has loved me, so I love you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you abide in my love. Verse 12, this is my commandment that you do what? Love one another. So God, I have loved you. Me, I keep the commandment. Well, what's the commandment? Love one another. And in that verse, verse 12, we see both. Love each other as I have loved you. How do I love you? I love you from the power of God's love inside of me by knowing it, reckoning it, and then presenting myself. If you struggle to love people, it most often is because you struggle to be loved. You don't really believe you're loved by God. And if you don't believe you're totally loved by God, I'm talking about totally loved by God, do, do you believe that God cannot love you any less? Let me ask you this. Do you believe that God cannot love you any more? A lot of us are okay with the idea, God can't love me less. I get that. God can't love me less. Could God love you more than he does? Do you realize that he can't? He loves you infinitely. Now, right now, today. In spite of the mess that you are. You can't make him love you more. Galatians 2.20, this is, this is my verse. This is my go-to. I love this verse. I think the whole Christian experience is summed up in this verse. God, God's role. He crucified me with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Do you see how Paul says that? He does not, the second half of the verse doesn't say, therefore I do nothing, right? It's not me anyway, it's Jesus living through me, so I'm just going to do nothing. I just kind of go through life, whatever. No, the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. Do you see that? It's both. Paul doesn't stop living. He keeps living. He's living as Christ lives through him. Philippians 2, this one starts, he starts with the me. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Okay, so I have to work at my, at my salvation. 13, however, look at God. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Who's doing the work? Is, am I doing the work or is God doing the work? Both. <laughs> Both. God did the work. Now I do the work. I, he, works, he works out through me. Do you see it? Grace-driven effort. But see, as soon as you, as soon as you lop off verse 13, you got a lot of Christians running around going, I'm working out my salvation today as if you could be more saved today than you were yesterday. Colossians 3, 
You died. Look at 3.3. 3. Colossians 3 is basically a shorter, more succinct uh, summary of Romans 6. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That's God. He killed you. God killed the old you. Your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Now, can you see the me part? Can you predict what's going to turn yellow when I click the button? Verse 5, what do we do? Put to death. Verse 12, put on. It got cut off at the bottom. Verse 14, above all, put on love. Do you see it? I died. The old me is dead, but the new me is alive. The new me is alive. And so I crucify the dead stuff inside of me. I crucify the works inside of me that are dead works. Instead, I put on works of faith. 1 John 3. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are. Verse 2, dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Do you see it? The God part. His love is lavished on us. We are called children of God. We will be like Jesus, for we shall see him as he is. The me part, purify yourself. Second Peter, his divine power has given us everything we need for godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine, that should say nature, in the divine nature I accidentally cut out the word nature there. Having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. This is all God, this whole, these whole two verses. His divine power has given you everything you need for a godly life. You participate in the divine nature. Notice that it's through what? Knowledge. My faith comes from my knowledge. Then watch this, verse 5, for this reason, make every what? Effort to add to your faith, etc., etc. I, I, I cut those down short, uh, small, I mean, so I could fit all this on one screen. We're adding to our faith all of those character traits there. This is the me. We make every effort. Why? Because this will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, a lot of you guys got a lot of knowledge crammed in that head of yours. That knowledge better turn into faith. You've done the no part of no reckon, present, but you're, you're camped there. I know it. I know it. And it's a head knowledge, right? But you better get this head knowledge down to your heart knowledge and start actually believing it and operating from it. And to operate from it means you have to present yourself. You have to pursue. You have to make every effort. Because like I said, you don't just stumble into godliness. Right? We know that we have been cleansed from our past sins. And there's the God part again. So let's wrap up with a couple quick examples here. Um, witnessing. If you're a 100% God person, you probably don't witness. Because <clears throat> God does it. Mark was talking about this yesterday <clears throat> at our witnessing um, training, our evangelism training. Um, 
God's going God's to save people anyway. You know, God's sovereign, so God's doing it anyway. So I'm just trusting God to save Uncle Bob, Aunt Joyce, whoever. I'm, 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 I'm just, God will do that. If you're a 100% me person, then, then you're like, oh, I better witness or their blood is on my hands, Right? If I don't share my faith with everyone, you're going crazy and you're, you're completely stressed out about it. And then you feel guilty because you don't witness enough. But God is calling us to the balance of it's all him and it's you. Right? I plant seeds. Paul planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Right? Let me say this. I should have said this at the beginning and I forgot. Why effort? Why grace-driven effort? Are we doing anything for God? Listen, God is self-sufficient, everybody. Do you realize that? This is how amazing and grace-filled and merciful and loving God is. Our effort, we're not, we're not doing anything for God. God's got everything he needs, right? Right? This is how we experience him. This is how we experience his grace and his glory. Our grace-driven effort is the grace of God. It's God's way of working alongside of us to accomplish something that he could very well accomplish without you. Do you understand that? If you don't witness at all, guess what? God's still going to get who God wants, right? Kingdom's still moving forward, right? Bus is still driving. It's his grace that he allows you on the bus. It's his grace that he allows you to be part of the work. Do you see that? So, so our effort as a church is not about, oh, if we don't do this, then somehow the kingdom of God is going to shut down. And God's not going to get the glory he needs. God doesn't need glory. He's already got it. God doesn't need love. He's already got that. This is all about God sharing with you. Wow, if you will let that soak in, it'll change everything you do as a Christian. If you begin to see everything you do, not about God demanding it from you because he needs it, but rather God sharing with you. Man, won't that change the way you read the Bible? Won't that change the way you walk into this building? Won't that change how you do everything? Won't that change all of your relationships? It's God sharing with you. If you're 100% God, then you've backed off relationships and you've said, well, I can't do any, I can't, I can't change my wife anyway. I'm just putting her in God's hands. If you're 100% me, then you're manipulating and controlling all your relationships, right? In order to get what you want out of the person. But if you're balanced with it's God and me, then yes, you realize only God's going to change the person, but you are called to love the person and sacrifice for the person and talk to the person, disciple the person. Overcoming sin, if it's just a God thing, oh, well, eventually God's going to wave his magic wand and this sin in my life, is this addiction, this, this desire inside of me, God's going to make it go away. Or if you're 100% me, then you're, you, you know, uh, you, by sheer willpower, you're overcoming your sin, and you, can, you, know, you might be able to do that, but you're just going to replace it with another sin because that's how willpower and behavior modification work. If it's God and you, then God's grace drives you to identify the idols in your life and replace them with Jesus because His grace is better than whatever it is you're seeking after. And lastly, Bible, and these are just four examples out of, a, out of a million, a million things. Bible study, prayer. You know, some people, it's all about God. God's just going to, uh, uh, you know, uh, you take your Bible and let's see, what should I read today? Okay, God, zap me with a good verse. And, and, and then we're just waiting for this mystical experience, Right? 
The 100% me is, ah, I better read my Bible today. You know, it's on my checklist of things to do. Better break out my Bible. Better read what it says. And you probably are so bored with reading the Bible at this point. But the balance is study. Study to show yourself approved, right? At the same time, the Holy Spirit takes the Word of God and ministers it to our hearts, doesn't He? 100% God, but it's also 100% you because you got to study it, right? You got to study it. More of Him, more of me. Let's pray. God, may your grace overwhelm us. May we see that even our effort, even our effort is your grace. Without you, we do nothing. Father, may all of our efforts, may all of our faith-driven efforts be backed by grace. Oh God, I, I beg you to, to teach this to us. Spirit, teach this to us. Show us how this applies to us today, Father. We praise you for your work on the cross, Jesus. We thank you for what it means to us. We thank you for what it has done in our